I want to invite you to take your Bibles and uh, turn to the letter of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're actually in our second week of this one passage from verse 13 uh, to verse 18. We will read in, in just a moment, so maybe on your app or on um, your physical copy of God's Word on your phone or tablet, go ahead and turn to 1 Peter 3, and in just a few moments we'll read verses 13 through 18. Uh, I I, I am not on TikTok. I'm actually getting on less and less social media the older I get. Uh, and so uh, I just, just, I'm just trying to kind of take a survey here. This is not a trick question. Uh, anybody here on TikTok? I know we got a few people. Anybody use TikTok? we got a few. Okay, come on. Some of y'all don't want to admit it. And it's, not, it's not a sin to be on TikTok. Uh, I'm not on TikTok, but I was reading a news article uh, this week, and it actually talked about a new TikTok trend. There's a new one every week, right? Uh, you can't keep up with them. But there's this new uh, trend that's going on TikTok. This is really good. You're thinking, oh, it's TikTok. It's not going to be that good. Uh, here, it says it's called, uh, I'd never heard of it before this week, it's called the Doritos Theory. Has anybody seen the Doritos Theory? All right, you, you TikTok users you probably just aren't using enough. I usually don't say that. Uh, and so here's the Doritos theory. The Doritos theory is this, that it says whenever you're eating potato chips, and, and that's my weakness. Like, I can walk past a piece of cake, but the chips, man, they've always been my weak point, that salty stuff. He says, they say whenever uh, you're eating some type of potato chips, specifically they're using the word Doritos here, it's addictive because, listen to this, stay with me, the peak of the experience is only when you're tasting it and there's nothing afterwards. Let me say that again. The peak of the experience of you eating those lack of nourishing chips or whatever it may be, the peak of the experience is right in that moment when it's in your mouth, and then what? Yeah, everybody's laughing and shaking their heads. My wife despises when I eat Doritos, not because they're not nutritious, but when I was young, I haven't eaten potato chips in years, and it's not because I'm so good. It's because i got to be more disciplined the older I get because metabolism's just not working the way it used to. But my, my wife used to hate me eating Doritos because my favorite type of Doritos were the Cool Ranch ones. And you know what they're known for, right? They'll give you breath that you could smell it from you know, the back row. And so my wife said, do you have to eat Cool Ranch Doritos again? But the reality is this, is the experience of eating something that has no nourishment, that tastes so good like Doritos, only gives you an experience for just a moment, and there's nothing good it does for you in the moment after you quit tasting it. And you're saying... Why is this pastor talking about Doritos? I thought we were going to be talking about the gospel this morning. So let me tell you why. Experiences that aren't really satisfying are actually more addictive is the theory of this. That we get more self or instant gratification from things that seem so good in the moment but have no lasting effects. I think we all could agree, especially as adults, that there's going to be a lot more nutrients and satisfaction from whether you're a vegetarian, a good plate of vegetables, or if you're a meat eater, and man, you got a nice, healthy steak, there's going to be a lot more satisfaction long-term from that, and you're really going to be that word satiated even longer when you eat what is right and good and healthy. So I'm not here to give you a lesson on food this morning, am I? I'm here to talk to you about your spiritual life and your eternal life. And the problem is, is that you and I eat a lot of social Doritos in life. We're getting consumed by everything the world has to offer, and it feels good in the moment. Maybe it's something just as simple as social media that could be good or bad. Uh, maybe the news. Maybe you're getting pulled into other addictive behaviors like pornography or other addictions of chemicals and other things. There's always that... Instant gratification in the moment, isn't there? And then there's nothing good for you after that. And so what I want to offer for you is not just an alternative, but what really matters is can I let you feast and will you feast with me on the meat and potatoes and the vegetables of God's word this morning? That it's going to provide a satisfaction that goes beyond maybe just tasting good in the moment, but it will change the course of Monday tomorrow. When Sam goes back to work tomorrow, guess what? He's got a different perspective than he had last Monday, doesn't he? Not, not, not because social media really changed him, not because Doritos changed him, but because Christ is changing him from his testimony he just gave this morning. So this morning, will you pick up the meat and vegetables with me as we read God's Word? Stand with me as we read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 18.
Who then will harm you if you're devoted to what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Fear not what they fear, or be intimidated, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. May God bless the meat and the vegetables, the potatoes of his word. You may be seated. Jesus said in a conversation he had with a woman who had a really bad reputation in her town of Samaria, after he had finished this conversation with her, he had shared the gospel with her, and she didn't realize that who she was talking to was the gospel. I don't know if you get what I'm saying, because the gospel's not just words, but it's a person, it's a relationship, and God is inviting us into a love relationship with him. And so when Jesus finished Uh, this conversation with this lady that she knew he was different. First, he respected her. He loved her, and he asked her some questions that she knew he was different. After he had shared the good news of Jesus, she ran off and could not wait to go back to town to find all the people in the town and say, hey, come with me. I think I found the Messiah. I think he's the one, and everybody came back. But his disciples had been gone, and they came back to him. And as they're bringing food... He wasn't so interested in the food. And mind you, he was hungry. He hadn't eaten. He was tired. And he says in John chapter 4, verse 32, he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. He didn't have a lamb sandwich there. He didn't have any fresh squeezed grape juice. He didn't have any olives. He didn't have any pita bread. He had not eaten anything. And physically, he was still very hungry. But as he said to the disciples who just brought him back some food, they're thinking, did you get food from somewhere else? And Jesus said, I've got food that you don't know anything about. Do you know what his food was? To do the will of the Father, and that he had just got, became satisfied with sharing the good news of himself with someone else. I would venture to say that the majority of the people in this room who call themselves Christians have probably never had a gospel conversation I don't say that to belittle you or hurt you or to make you feel less than. I'm only wanting to encourage you because if you as a follower of Christ who've truly been changed by the power of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you've been obedient, you've been baptized, and you're part of this local kingdom here at Wiregrass, if you've not yet entered into a gospel conversation with somebody, we're not trying to push those things. I'm not trying to make you force people into Christianity. I'm not trying to talk about taking a Bible and hitting people over the head. Don't misunderstand maybe what you think of when we talk about gospel conversations. But everybody's in need, and some people realize they have a need and they don't know what the answer is. And so I can promise you this, the greatest satisfaction you and I can have, I said this last week, I'll say it again before we get into the meat of the text, that whenever you share the good news of Jesus with someone, it's the most satisfying and the most worshipful thing you can do. It is more worshipful than the most beautiful worship song on a Sunday morning because you are telling a lost person who's heading towards hell how everything can change in a moment when you turn from yourself and sin and the system of the world and turn to Christ who paid for everything for you. And I'll promise you this, as a man who has tried to share the gospel and many times I've not said it perfectly and I've messed it up and I've not gotten it right and I haven't answered every question, that as I've come to realize we can get past some of the debates that are minor and go to the heart of the matter, who is Jesus, that when we have those conversations, whether they trust Christ or not, because that's not on you, that's on the Holy Spirit, that when we have those conversations, we can walk away satisfied and we can begin to understand what Jesus said in John 4, 32, I have food to eat that you don't know about, that you can be satisfied because not only has the Word of God changed you, But now the good news of Jesus is being used to change and influence someone else. 
I hope today that you'll start being satisfied on the food that comes from God. First Peter chapter 3, we spent last week really kind of leading up to a phrase I want to focus on today, that we don't have to be afraid. Verses 13 and 14 was, we don't have to live in fear. That when we fear God in a reverential sense, in, a, in an awe sense of His greatness and His majesty, His sovereignty, we don't have to fear anything else in the world. Uh, and then he says this, and it's, it was an inside job, it was preparation. He says, but first, sanctify or set apart or regard Christ as holy in your heart. So before you're ever, and I am ever ready for a gospel conversation, it's an inside job before it ever becomes an outside external job. There's been time, I'm not even going to get into the story yet, maybe we'll get to it today of, of how I've done it wrong so many times. But I want to tell you this, we spent the whole message, if you weren't here last week, maybe this is your first week, or maybe you just missed last week, go back to last week's message. We've spent the whole time talking about how do we set Christ apart as Lord in our heart, because that happens for those who are believers of saying, hey, Christ Jesus is the priority. No, nothing else in my life is a priority over Jesus, whatever I have to do. And so we focused on setting Christ apart as Lord, as master in our heart. Do you, you know this? In the first century Rome, um, if, um, if a Christian in the first century of Rome said, Jesus is God, if they yelled that out in the streets, you know what the response would be? Okay, there's a lot of gods. There's all these statues, all these idols all up and down the street. Oh, yeah, okay, that's fine. But in first century Rome, if a Christian said, Jesus is Lord and Master, you know what could be a problem then? It may cost them their life because the government, the Caesar, was Master, was Lord. And in today's language, we don't want anybody as a Master, but when you don't have anybody as a Master, then you've got a whole lot of Masters and you don't realize it. And so when we talk about setting apart Jesus Christ as Lord, that actually was certain death for people of the first century. And today, people don't understand it. But for you and I, when we realize that Jesus is our Lord, our Master, we ultimately submit to Him in every part of our life, that's going to change the dynamics of how we are ready to have a gospel conversation with someone and so we talked about last week setting Christ apart as Lord in your heart uh, and what that looks like in real time in the quiet place, in the private place of our life. But today I want to focus on this part, but he says, after regarding Christ the Lord as holy, then after that, that we can be ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope that is within us. So getting ready on the inside is an inside job, that we're to be prepared in time with God in His Word, in time with His people on a regular basis, not occasionally, in time in prayer, in time in wanting to be ready. And what's coming into our hearts, what's coming into our ears and our eyes is affecting us. That when we get ready on a day-by-day -day and a moment-by-moment -moment basis, then we're going to be ready. Ready to surrender, we'll be abandoned to the will of Jesus in our life. Let me put it to you this way. We all can point to a lot of truths. Now, the world has this dysfunctional idea that your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. And that's, that's hogwash. That's not even rational. It's not logical. There is moral absolute truth. And I believe many of us in this room will believe this, um, but there are many more who are not that truth is whatever you want to make it to be. But l let me put it to you this way. There is absolute truth, and it begins with our Creator. But I want to go farther that you can intellectually know a truth you can know a fact, that's probably a better word because a fact and a truth have some connections, but you can know a fact, but it does not change you or shape you unless it goes, listen, stay with me on this, unless it goes from your mind to your heart. Remember setting Christ apart as Lord in your heart? So the problem is there's a lot of people that know facts and even truth that over, overlap and interlink. But until that truth actually affects you in the core of who you are, the essence of who you are, which goes beyond your brain, it really doesn't change you to change your life. And that's the problem. There's a lot of people who call themselves Christians because they're not Buddhist or Hindus. But the truth of Jesus and who he is, the tough stuff in here, has never gone from here to here. And so, as some people say, the 12 inches or however far it is, 
It's a huge journey, but they're both essential. Let me tell you this, and I'll kind of reference um, a, a great apologist. We'll talk about the word apologies in a minute. That doesn't mean saying sorry. Uh, the, the priority for you and for those that you engage with is a, is a dual priority of the mind and of the heart. And you say, how do both of those have a priority? The reason is this. Nobody in this room who has truly accepted Christ as their Savior has ever checked their brain at the door before they came to Christ. There is never blind faith. Any blind faith is illogical and irrational. But for you to truly trust Jesus where it changes the essence of who you are down in here, down in here in the soul, before it changes that, it first has to enter our mind. God made our bodies and us as people that way, to be rational and logical thinkers. And so the good news of Jesus, of what he did because of our problem, our sin problem, it must enter our mind, so we must be able to communicate it well. What's the verse in Romans 10? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The word. The word must be declared, and it must enter into our minds before it ever changes our heart and our life. And so the good news of Jesus must enter our minds, but also, subsequently, next step, it must enter our hearts. There's too many people that claim Christianity that it never got past here because they know the right answers, but their life's not changed. And there's people say, hey, I'm a Christian, and they look like the rest of the world, and they're not saved because they know the intellectual academic of what Jesus did but it's never changed their submission to Jesus as their king. And boy, was I guilty of that. So the good news of Jesus must enter our minds, and then it will enter our hearts. That's when the truth of Jesus becomes, listen to this, salvation. The gospel is only good news when it gets to the essence, the core of who we are, eternal life. In that moment when it goes from our mind to our heart and it changes us, that's when salvation happens. And so we must engage the mind. Uh, I, I want to share this with you, that the Christian faith, while it does require faith, by the way, um, humanism and evolution and all of those things require a whole lot more faith than Christianity. Faith that doesn't even make sense. If you want to believe that everything came from nothing, go ahead. But my faith has logic and reason. So each of these, our mind and our hearts, have equal in importance, they're different though, but it must first enter our mind before it becomes the main priority in our heart. Is everybody with me on that? And our mind is first in sequence, as it's been said, but our heart is first in importance. And so when we come to the Christian faith and gospel conversations and sharing the good news of Jesus, we must understand the, the importance of both of those, here and here. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 15 says this. I like how the ESV puts it because different translations say it a little differently, but this one drives it home. The ESV says it this way. An intelligent heart. Have you ever thought about that? Because what do we usually ascribe intelligence with? Our mind. And, and, and that is correct. That's not wrong. But our mind is deeper than just our brain, right? Our, our mind is much more than our brain. It affects who we are. And so the ESV says in Proverbs 18, 15, an intelligent heart. You may have a smart brain and a stupid heart. I know I have in past. But Proverbs 18, 15 says an intelligent heart. You know what it acquires? It acquires knowledge. Knowledge is essential for the gospel to know the creator. Intelligent heart acquires knowledge. And the ear of the wise, you know what they seek? They seek knowledge, but they discern knowledge of what's right and best. So he makes a connection between intelligence and the core of who we are, not just our brains. I had someone that I recently spoke to uh, who loves the camaraderie and the fellowship of Wiregrass Church. They came fairly regular and still come at time to time. They like the nice parts about Jesus, like his miracles and the nice things he said. They really struggle with the brutal death of Jesus and the brutality of that we see in Scripture because Scripture does not mitigate how messy life is. That's one of the things about Scripture I love is it never tries to sell you. It speaks truth, and then by the Holy Spirit, the truth will change you. And so they've wrestled with this because they like the nice things of Jesus. They like the fellowship of Wiregrass Church. They see we're loving, 
but they struggle with the brutal death of Christ, how horrible our sin must be that it needs that, and that our biggest problem is self-pride and our rebellion against God. And they really, i just put it plainly, they really aren't ready to accept the Bible. And I loved getting that honesty because then I was able to see why I didn't, there was, seemed like there was a spiritual wall there. And so for you and me, we must not only logically and rationally, but we must come to understand that this Bible we have in front of us is the truth, the eternal truth of God's word. And it's messy because sin is messy and people are messy, but God is good and he's perfect. And he provided a perfect way for our messy and sinful lives. And the death of Jesus voluntarily, intentionally on our behalf shows us how bad our problem is. Because you know what? The good news of Jesus is very offensive. It says that I'm so bad that God had to die for me. I can't even die for myself. I can't even pay my own price. So the gospel is offensive, and it should offend us before we come to know Christ. If it hasn't offended you, you don't understand the gospel. But when we have come to realize what Jesus did for us, and it's his kindness, Romans 2, 4, that leads us to repentance, then we realize the beauty of the gospel in the midst of the brutality and how terrible it is. You cannot be saved unless you receive and accept all of who Jesus is and all of what he did for you. There's, there was, I think it was Thomas Jefferson, one of our founding fathers. He cut out all the parts of the New Testament he didn't like. And he left all the good kind of basic things that he did that he had agreed with. You can't be a Christian and that happen. You must trust God that Jesus is the creator and that he is sovereign over every book of the Old Testament through the Gospels and today, and he's a king, the king on the throne. We can't just like the nice parts of Jesus and throw away the parts that we don't like. As it says about being ready today in verse 15 to make a defense um, for um, anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that's within you. If I ask you today, what is, what is your defense what is your apologia, which means the word defense. Apologia doesn't mean um, I, I'm sorry. It actually is defense or defending the faith. When someone was uh, an apologist in the first century, uh, they actually were a defender. They were an attorney-type defender that got someone who had been accused of something wrong out of their trouble. So they were called out from the trouble they were accused of. Uh, and the first, probably one of the first apologists in all of church history was a guy named Justin Martyr. You probably understand the word martyr. We've talked about that before. But Justin Martyr had to push back against errant things that were being said about the church. Number one, uh, there, there was a bad rumor going around uh, that uh, those people were had their meetings in their churches. They were actually practicing cannibalism. And you're like, how do you get that? Well, what did Jesus say about the Lord's Supper? Yeah, he was, he was talking about that. And in the midst of that, there was this rumor spread that, hey, they're, they're practicing cannibalism in there. And Justin Martyr said, wait a second, let's get this right. This juice and this bread remind us of what Christ done for us. It's not cannibalism. Uh, they would have love feasts where it was hospitality to people of all ranks, of all social status, which was unheard of in that day. Rich and poor coming together to share a meal. And you know what they would call that in that love feast? Because that was the name for it. They would call that sexual immorality and orgies. And Justin Martyr would have to say, wait a second, no, that's not what it is. We are honorably coming together. There was all kind of things that Justin Martyr, being one of the first apologists, would have to say to say, hey, no, this is right. Uh, Christians in the first century were called atheists. And you know what an atheist is today? An atheist is someone who doesn't believe in God. The Christians were called atheists. You know why? Because they didn't believe in all the pantheon of gods, all the hundreds of gods through Athens and all throughout the Roman world. And so as they didn't believe in that, the Christians didn't believe in any of that. They must be atheists. And Justin Martyr says, no, we're not atheists. We're actually committed theists to one true God. And so Justin Martyr in the first century was having to uh, redefine and help people understand this is what really matters and this is the truth. And so today, I want to ask you, my friend, have you spent enough time in God's Word as you grow in your walk with Christ and knowing Jesus that you can say, hey, can I tell you the truth of maybe what you believe or what some social media post or some errant communicator on YouTube said to you? Can I share with you really the truth? So here's my challenge for you. If your defense of the gospel is 
hey, just believe in God and do the best you can, you're still pointing people to hell. Let me share this with you. Why? If that's, if that's the extent of your belief that, hey, I believe in God and I'm trying to live a good life, the book of James says that even the demons, what are they? They believe. They know who God is. They know who Jesus is. They called him out as the Messiah, and they shudder. They had fear. So they believe more than most in regards to understanding his power. But guess where they're going? To hell. So you can believe in the dynamics, the truth of who God is, but if it hasn't gone from your mind to your heart, you're not yet saved. And the same with others who may believe certain parts of Christianity. And so in this defense, this being ready to give a defense for anyone who asks you, the first part of it is, number one, it's more than just believing in God because that's nice and fluffy in general and it doesn't get you in trouble. But realizing that Jesus is God and what he did for you. And if you just say, hey, I'm believing in God and trying to live a good life, then that moves into a work salvation, right? That, hey, I'm just trying to do the right things. And many people are trying to earn their salvation, and it can't be earned. And so if you're only defensive, say, hey, I believe in God or I have faith, well, what do you have faith in? I've heard so many people who profess Christianity, how do you know you're saved? Well, I have faith. Well, what do you have faith in? You, you got faith in that seat you're sitting on that's not going to fall down on you? I, I can appreciate that. But what is your faith in? And your faith, your trust Rational, logical trust and faith must be in the person of Jesus and what he has accomplished for you on your behalf. That's the only thing that saves you, not your good works. Only Christ. And so what is your defense of the faith? And so Peter's saying to the church in the first century, be ready to give a defense. That's not that you're to be offensive it's not here to be defensive in a mean or angry way, but you need to be ready to give a defense, an apologia, a, a defense of the gospel to anyone who asks you. Let me ask you this. Why, why would somebody ever want to ask you about this hope you have, according to 1 Peter 3.15? You know why? Because they've seen something different in my life, in your life. If nobody's ever asked you about what's different about you or why are you weird, not just because, uh, anyway, I won't go into all those jokes. <laughs> if you and I have never had anybody say, hey, there's something different about you, what's going on with you? If you've never had anybody ask you that, it's, it's a good inventory moment because I want to live different in a way that, do you know when my Christianity and when your Christianity is most seen? Not when everything's good and right and celebratory. Your Christianity is most seen in the bottom, in the valley, when everything's falling apart. That's when your Christianity and your lifestyle screams, my hope is in a different place than the bad circumstance right now. Remember in 1 Peter 3 uh, of how the wives were challenged to win their unbelieving husbands, how? By their lifestyle, not by uh, all of their accessories and how they dressed. They were challenged to win their husbands by their lifestyle because their husband may not listen to what they're saying, but they would listen to a changed lifestyle. And so for you and me, according to the last half of 1 Peter 3.15, are you and I, are we ready to give a defense for the hope that's within us? What is in your life that's provoking people to say, hey, there's something different about you? Not, not everybody has the gift of evangelism. There are some people, man, they, they can share the gospel on a street corner and a thousand people will come to Christ. And, and there's other people that that's just not the case. But while not, not all of us have the gift of evangelism, all of us have been called to do, listen to this, the work of an evangelist. Through hospitality, through love, through care, through ministry, through keeping your cool at work when everything's falling down around you, through loving your wife and your husband when they're going through a bad season, through walking with your children through their prodigal seasons, that's when your Christianity is seen. It's not really seen when everything's good. Everybody can celebrate when things are good, right? But when things are falling apart, they say, wait a second, there's something different about you. Tell me why you have this hope. Are you one of those Christians? And you can say, yeah, let me tell you why. Let me tell you what, who Jesus is and what he's done. 
your testimony is very important. How you came to Christ is important. Your, your sin, uh, your conversion, your, your life since Christ, was, that's, your testimony is important. But let me make clear to you, my friends, your testimony is not the gospel. It's a symptom. It's a response. It's a byproduct of the gospel. But you and I need to know the gospel. I'm not saying you need to be a theologian. You don't need to be a scholar. You don't need to have the whole New Testament memorized because I, I don't. I, I want to, but it just hasn't happened. The brain just doesn't work that good. But the point I want to make with you is this. Can you clearly and simply articulate that God created everything perfect and good? He, he made people perfect and good. He made creation perfect and good, and we chose to rebel. We turned against God. That's the mess of the world today. But in the midst of our mess and our sin and our rebellion, God sent his son to voluntarily come to this earth to live a perfect life on our behalf to die voluntarily on the cross as your substitute, as my substitute, to pay the price, the paycheck for our sins, that he willingly died because he loved you so much and didn't want you to be separated from him. And then on top of that, he rose again on the third day, beating death, to promise you eternal life. There's a simplicity of the gospel right there, 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Do you need to say it the same words I do? No. But the gospel is not your testimony. The testimony is a byproduct, a response of the gospel, but you and I need to be able to artic uh, articulate clearly what the good news of Jesus is. Why? Because that's where the power is. Here, here's what I do know is that in all the gospel conversations I've had over the years, more than not have had smaller, lesser debates about other religious things that crop up, just like Jesus and the woman at the well, John 4. But Jesus always got it back to the heart of the matter. And your and my goal is that we live in such a way that we provoke conversations from people. They say, hey, I want to talk to you. Hey, my life's falling apart. And I remember two years ago when your life was falling apart, I saw there was something different in you. Can you tell me where I can find hope or how you were able to make it through that time? And you're able to say, yeah, let me tell you why. Not because of me, but because of this person, Jesus, who he is and what he did for you. Be ready at any time to give a defense for the hope that is within you. Why? Because you've already set Christ apart as Lord in your heart. We should devote our lives to reading and knowing and studying and meditating on God's Word. We should devote our lives to gathering together with the family of God right here. This ought to be the highest priority of your week that you come together. But in the midst of all of that preparation, because our life is training, right? All of our life is training and preparation. That along with that, when it comes time to have that conversation and your knees are knocking like mine still is after all these years of sharing the gospel, here's what Jesus said to his disciples. Don't worry about how you should defend yourselves or what you should say, Luke 12, 11, and 12. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what must be said. I never want to minimize understanding the gospel, being able to clearly sum up the gospel, to know the good news of Jesus is so important but at the bottom line, it's not about how pushy you or I can be to argue somebody in the kingdom of heaven. I have never, and you will never argue anybody into the kingdom of heaven. There's a place for good reason. There's a good place for good debate. That can be healthy if done correctly, if our heart's in the right place. But you and I will never argue or be a keyboard warrior to get somebody in the kingdom of heaven. I promise you that. Here's what's going to happen, and here's how it's going to happen. Verse 16, as he, as he finishes verse 15, that is, uh, going into verse 16, yet do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. 